uh, for me and a great privilege really, to have uh, you here, Professor Adeke and the Bajo. We, um, we haven't worked together, you know, uh, uh, but I know you <laughs> very well <laughs> because uh, we've crossed paths uh, from time to time and have followed your work and have read many of your business and pieces over the year and seen some of your work. And uh, uh, you know, you wrote a chapter for us. We did, yes, in the South African foreign policy. That's and right. we launched it together at DTI. That's right. Yes, yeah. that's right. <laughs> so over the years, yes, yeah, our paths have crossed, uh, and we had many mutual friends. Yeah, speak highly of you, and uh, so uh, you've been the subject of uh, many dinner table conversations. Uh, all very positive. <laughs> so it's such a great pleasure uh, to, to have you here at the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance. So for those who don't know me, my name is Faisal Ismail, and uh, I was a, a diplomat at one time, uh, worked for the South African government for many, many, many years as a, a trade diplomat, and then uh, transitioned to uh, follow the various career path and tried to be an academic. So I'm now the head of the school. And uh, this is a fabulous school, the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance, um, which is um, located here, but it's facing north. Uh, it's an African institution. And we work on public policy, uh, on governance, on uh, integration, economic integration, on climate change, and a number of other issues, uh, both from on the research and policy, but also very much involved in practice and implementation of public policy. So great pleasure to, to have you here at IKEA because your work really speaks to the ethos of the school. It speaks also to the, um, the values uh, of the school that you uh, talk about in your books and are concerned to decolonize uh, academia and uh, to also uh, speak to the uh, the issues of leadership, uh, governance, uh, development, which are all themes that you have worked on over the years in many of your writings. So it's great to see you here. So Adekeya Adebayo, for those of you who don't know him, I'm sure you all have uh, read some of his work. He uh, comes from Nigeria. Uh, you, uh, if you didn't know that, you would when you see him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he studied at uh, the great uh, Ishida University, then uh, studied also uh, in the United States, uh, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and did his PhD at Oxford University. Uh, and uh, since then, has done a lot of work uh, in the field um, uh, in the United Nations, uh, working um, in uh, far flung areas from Western Sahara to um, Liberia, and of course, South Africa <laughs> during uh, its difficult times, but has spent uh, uh, a long time here uh, in uh, more time in Cape Town than I have. But uh, <laughs> knows the uh, you know, workings of the South African state, um, and has written a fabulous book on Tabo and Becky, which I, I enjoyed reading very much um, uh, a few years ago. Okay, uh, so thank you very much, uh, really, for your uh, contributions, really, to the um, uh, the, the politics of our continent, um, but also. Um, uh, as I read uh, uh, your book on Butrus, Butrus Valley, you really gave me, uh, I know a little bit about the UN and how it works, especially the, the trade part of it uh, and governance, but the insights on the Security Council and the inner workings of the United Nations that you get, um, it comes from a person who appears to have been on the inside <laughs> of the institution and giving us really the nuances uh, of the politics. Uh, so thank you so much for, for bringing this book uh, to, uh, uh, to us. Um, 
uh, a great scholar, Boutrous uh, Boutrous Ghali, uh, an academic uh, and an intellectual, and you were introducing him to us really in the book, and uh, I, I didn't know most of what you talked about, uh, the complexity of his own personality and identity as an African, but an Arab and a Francophile, and that sort of complexity and uh, and tension in his own personality plays itself out also in his politics. And you bring up to the relationship between uh, Egypt and uh, its uh, complex relationship with uh, its neighbors, mm -hmm. both mm -hmm. on both sides of the uh, uh, of uh, the continent, uh, the Arab world, and then the African continent, uh, and uh, the tension between uh, Egypt's uh, relationship with the United States. And uh, its uh, relationship with France, mm -hmm. and its relationship with well, his personal relationship with France, other than the country, yes. But the relationship between Egypt and the continent, and and how it uh, it has played out since then. But uh, uh, you know, I think the insights you provide us um, speak very much to where Egypt is today. Yeah. So as you read it, it helped me understand much better. Many of the, my colleagues that I've gotten to know over the years from Egypt made me understand them a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> about those tensions yeah. they themselves out mm -hmm. in their politics um, and their relationship with, with Africa. Yeah. So thank you very much, really, for, for uh, bringing this book to us. And I'm going to ask you, really, to speak to your book. And uh, we'll open the floor after that, and I may make a few comments. Uh, after you've spoken about um, uh, the very uh, uh, interesting book that you've written and uh, how you got it down really in, in so few pages and so few words, you can see the enormous amounts of research that went into it, the depth of it, uh, you can see to the nuances <laughs> that you provide. So, so really well done uh, to offering uh, people like me who want to quick read. <laughs> uh, Quite a lot of depth in very uh, a short book. So perhaps we want to play the video first and then okay. hand over to you. Zali. A moment of remembrance for the man who led the United Nations through some of its most difficult times. Members of the UN Security Council stood in silence to pay tribute to Boutros Boutros Ghali, the sixth Secretary General, who's died at the age of 93. The Egyptian took office when the international community perhaps seemed more united than at any time since the creation of the UN. But the end of the Cold War also brought fresh conflict. Within four months of Boutros starting the job, war broke out in the Balkans. The UN's initial response, a peacekeeping mission to Bosnia and Croatia called UNPROFOR, was widely criticized and did little to stop the bloodshed. As that conflict was still raging, a genocide on another continent. The UN and its small peacekeeping force in Rwanda, unable to stop one of the world's worst atrocities in modern history, the death of hundreds of thousands of people in a matter of weeks. Very often. As Secretary General, Boutros blames some of the failings on the system. And in more recent years, he continued to call for reform. This interview with Al Jazeera in 2009. We need the drastic change. The reform will not be able to, a, 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 a little reform will not, will not be able to cope with the new situation. We are living a new situation which is completely different than the situation which was existing in 1945. When Boutros left the top job at the UN, he was a man with unfinished business. He'd wanted a second term, but after five years, he'd lost favor with the then US President Bill Clinton and his ambassador to the UN, Madeleine Albright. It was decided he should be passed over for a man seen as younger and more dynamic. Kofi Annan, James Bayes, Al Jazeera.
Thank you very much, everybody. And I want to thank the ambassador, Ishmael, Petunia, and all of you for making time out of busy schedules to come and also just to greet our online audience as well. This is such a beautiful building and it's good to be back in Cape Town. And I told Ambassador Ishmael that one of the things I wanted to do was to make a pitch because I believe he's running such a wonderful school with really great and innovative programs that is training the next generation of policymakers. But one of the things I thought was important as a gap was for the students to understand the policy, political and security situation, because without conflict resolution, regional integration and all the other good things cannot happen. So we need to link security closer to economic development and integration. So that's my pitch. I want to do four things in the 20 minutes or so that I have here. First, briefly, to trace the family influences that shaped Putrus Gali. Uh, second, uh, to outline three typologies of prophet, pharaoh, and poet uh, through which I describe Putrus Gali. Third, to explain the contribution of this book to the academic literature. And finally, to assess Putrus Gali's legacy. Butros Butros Gali was born in Cairo on 14th of November, 1922. He attended the French secondary school in the Egyptian capital, living in the family mansion. And Butros came from the 200 top families in Egypt, and his family was one of the largest landowners. So he came from nobility. He often visited Dahir Square, Ishmaila, in his youth and embraced Egypt's rich heritage, cultural heritage. His father, Youssef Bey, had studied law in France as early as 1909, and his mother, Sophie Charabin, uh, her father was one of Egypt's most prominent historians. The Cairo in which Boutros grew up was not dissimilar to many of the evocative descriptions of Palestinian-American intellectual Edward Said's own Tyrian childhood. The city's ornate Victorian and Mediterranean architecture stood alongside bustling bazaars, uh, minareted mosques, and the allegorical alleys that Nagib Mahfouz, the Egyptian Nobel laureate, described so vividly. A Coptic Christian from a politically connected family, Boutros acquired a deep sense of noblesse oblige uh, and a commitment to public service from his family heritage. His grandfather, Boutros Ghali Pasha, had been the prime minister of Egypt under the British protectorate, before being gone down by an assassin's bullet in 1910. Two uncles had been foreign minister, and one of them, Wasi, a poet and intellectual in his own right, was the greatest influence on Boutros, pushing him towards public service. Another uncle had been agriculture minister. But Boutros was also the ultimate outsider a patrician within a mass of poverty in his own country, a Coptic Christian within a large Muslim majority in Egypt, and an Arab within a continental Black African uh, population in which he was basically Mr. Africa in his system. And he basically, as de facto foreign minister, was the one that was dealing with the OEU and Africa for 14 years. After completing his undergraduate law degree at the University of Cairo, he then went on to Sciences Po in Paris for his master's before getting his doctorate with distinction at the Sorbonne in Paris. Uh, Boutroscali was a self-described cosmopolitan Arab federalist, but his model was that of Germany's Otto von Bismarck and he believed strongly that Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, and Jordan should form a federation with Egypt. Um, 
he basically, after graduating, went back to the University of Cairo, at, became a professor at 27 and taught international law and international relations for 28 years. He published the first book on the UN in Arabic and continued to publish on the UN, on the OAU, and the Paris of the 1940s in which Boutroscali grew up had a lot of Maghrebi youths uh, from Morocco, from Algeria, from Tunisia, who were pushing for the independence of their countries in, that, in the 1940s. And Boutros was very much part of that ferment and a denizen of Parisian cafes where he loved to do his work. He was also, from this early stage as a young professor, a committed multilateralist who believed very strongly in the UN and its institutions, worked on the UN and regional organizations like the Arab League, which was what his PhD was, and also worked on the non-aligned movement and was skeptical of both NAM and NATO uh, in actually distorting the UN's work. He published over a hundred journal articles on many of these issues. Um, he then worked as head of the al Aram Center for Strategic and Political Studies before swapping the world of theory for practice in serving as Egypt's Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, the de facto foreign minister, excuse me, between 1977 and 91. Boutros married twice, once to Lily Khalil, who was a suborn trained archaeologist, highly qualified, and after divorcing her, married Leah Nadler, an Egyptian Jew, daughter of uh, rich Alexandria confectioners, but he never had any kids with either wife. Boutros Ghali's career is portrayed in this biography in terms of, prop, as I said, prophet, pharaoh, and pope. He acted as a prophet in basically leading Egypt's Middle East negotiations with Israel between 1977 and 1981. And his entire academic and public life had prepared him for the role of UN Secretary General. As Secretary General, Boutros played the role of a stubborn pharaoh in an often imperious approach to standing up against powerful members of the UN Security Council. And as a pope, uh, as UN Secretary General, he led conceptual debates on development, democracy, and human rights, and also organized mega conferences on the environment, on human rights, on population, on social development, and the Women's Conference in Beijing, of course, in 1995. Of the eight former UN Secretary Generals since 1945, no historical biography, quite incredibly, exists in English on Boutros Ghali. The only one was published in French by Alain Dejame, who is the former French ambassador in Egypt and at the UN, a very solid biography from which I benefited. Uh, and this is surprising considering that Boutros is the most intellectually accomplished office holder in this job in the 78 years it's existed. An eminent scholar diplomat and the sixth UN Secretary General, he held the office as we heard there in the immediate post-Cold War era when cooperation between the US and Russia re uh, resumed after a 45-year thaw. And there was an unprecedented number of UN peacekeeping missions that were established on the Boutros, so that by 1994, 17 missions had been deployed um, in various trouble spots. Uh, at the UN. Before then, the previous four decades, only 13 missions had been deployed. So you can imagine in, in two years how much change had happened. This short biography tries to correct the anomaly of a missing biography in English on one of the most important UN Secretaries General. Boutros was the first Arab and the first African Secretary General. He was steeped in the intricacies of third world diplomacy, 
had a profound and intuitive grasp of the global South and was also deeply involved in the Arab-Israeli conflict, as well as the non-aligned movement's politics. In his first four years in the Egyptian foreign ministry on the Midan al-Tahir, he acted as a prophet in serving as one of the key architects in the Camp David Accords with Israel, brokered by the US in 1978, and of course, the bilateral treaty that emerged isolated Egypt, basically, in the rest of the Arab world. And the Arab League moved its capital from Cairo. And it led to the assassination of Egyptian head of state and was that by extremists in 1981. Boutros actually wrote memoirs in 1997, Egypt's Road to Jerusalem, which captured many of these issues from his own point of view. And I used other sources by people like Jimmy Carter and Moshe Dayan to supplement Boutros's and also scholars like Abi Shleim as well. So what I've tried to do in this biography is not just focus on the five years of the UN Secretary General, but also to put more emphasis on his 14 years as Egypt's top diplomat, which many biographies haven't done. Boudreaux clashed fatally with the world body's most powerful member, the U.S., um, earning him the unenviable tag of being the only U.N. Secretary General to have been denied a second five-year term. The Egyptian acted as a stubborn pharaoh in bluntly condemning the double standards of the Western powers. He accused them of paying more attention to rich men's wars in the Balkans, while neglecting Africa's orphan conflicts. The French-trained Francophile, however, remained close to France and failed to condemn France's support, for example, to uh, genocidaire, uh, Hutu genocidaire during the 1994 genocide. France had armed and trained the genocidaire at the time. The council's powerful members also in turn ignored many of Boutros Ghali's own uh, visionary suggestions, making clear to him that they wanted a secretary and not a general. Um, Boutros Ghali, however, worked closely with the UN and achieved peacekeeping successes, for example, in Mozambique, in Cambodia, in El Salvador, but also suffered spectacular failures, as we saw there, in Bosnia, in Rwanda, in Somalia. His greatest legacy, I think, at the UN is the 1992 An Agenda for Peace, which is a framework that three decades later is still used for conflict resolution. And it has a continuum going from conflict prevention to peacemaking, to peacekeeping and peace building. And Antonio Guterres, the current UN Secretary General, has consciously built on this with his own a new agenda for peace in the current UN reforms. And one of the things I think Boutros also innovated was using regional organizations to lighten the load of the UN in terms of peacekeeping. So uh, the UN observers were sent to deploy alongside ECOMOC peacekeepers in Liberia between 1993 and 97, and it was the first time this had ever been done. Boutros Ghali also was successful in promoting norms of international transitional justice, uh, but suffered disappointments in the areas of development and democratization. He was an intellectual disciple of 17th century French philosopher Descartes and also Dutch jurist Hugo von Grotius' liberal humanism. But he was also in some ways a walking paradox because this guy who was deeply steeped in European liberal enlightenment values was also serving autocratic governments in Egypt for 14 years. So he somehow managed to uh, keep going with those paradoxes. He played the role of a post pope on the East River by basically trying to push the interests of poor developing countries who make up the majority of the 193 member UN General Assembly 
arguing strongly for reform of institutions and democratization of the UN Security Council, the World Bank, and IMF. And he often voiced the criticism that the Security Council and the UN in particular was too focused on the security interests of the powerful to the neglect of the development priorities of the weak majority in the UN system. Um, Putroskali captured all these events in 1999 memoirs on Vanquished, a US-UN saga, which was a very trenchant critique of his experiences, especially in regard to the UN. The importance of this book, then, is that no detailed biography of Boutros exists in English, despite the fact that his published two memoirs served as Egypt's top diplomat for 14 years and also as the world's most important diplomat during the momentous five years of the post-Cold War era. Many Western scholars and policymakers tend to depict Boutros because of his independence and arrogance uh, as an uppity native who did not know his place. And some of these scholars, like Michael Barnett, Ed Locke, um, Mans Fadel, have often disparaged the Egyptian's record and even, in my view, try to erase him from history. And so what I'm trying to do is to correct this glaring imbalance and to understand Boutros Ghali's career from within the political, social, and economic, and even cultural context from which he emerged, and the international system in which he had to operate. Um, uh, this book is basically trying to provide a comprehensive yet concise assessment of a, a figure that I feel is one of the most important scholar diplomats of the last century. I now conclude by analyzing Boutros Ghali's legacy as a prophet struck engaging in four years of peacemaking with Israel. Boutros transitioned from scholar to diplomat and held the post of Egypt's Minister of State for Foreign Affairs for another decade. During the Middle East negotiations, as a Coptic Christian with a Jewish wife, he faced real risks and threats of assassination were always there. And that the fact that he continued down this path for another decade, even after Sadat's assassination, after accompanying him to Jerusalem, took real courage. But Boutros had this belief, even though he wasn't particularly religious, that one's demise was preordained and could not be changed by human action. So he just kept going. He was politically astute enough to work with Britain, France, and Russia on Bosnia. He pleased the Chinese by banning or barring Taiwanese and Tibetan dissidents from the UN Secretariat. He won the unanimous endorsement of African leaders at the OAU for his re-election in 96, strongly supported by Nelson Mandela. But he was controversially removed from office in November of 96 uh, by America, which used its veto to cancel out the 14 other positive votes in his favor. Boutros had earlier complained uh, prophetically that he felt like a man who was condemned to execution. His nemesis, the American ambassador at the UN, Madeleine Albright, then acted as President Bill Clinton's willing executioner. She personally put Boutros's head to the guillotine and administered the fatal blow. She then presented the bodiless head to a bloodthirsty US Congress in a modern version of King Herod's gift of John the Baptist's head to his sanguinary wife's daughter, Salome. UN Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping, Ghana's Kofi Annan, became the second African UN Secretary General upon Boutros' departure. And he died in 2018, having served two terms and won the Nobel Peace Prize along with the UN in 2001. Where Boutros was arrogant and cerebral, Annan was affable and charming. 
where Boutros was seen um, as an aloof, pompous pharaoh, Anan was regarded as an accessible, personable prophet. But while even Boutros's worst enemies considered that he was an intellectual, none of Kofi Annan's best friends tried to sell him as a scholar. <laughs> um, and uh, Kofi Annan, in retrospect, the 2001 Nobel citation that praised him for being preeminent in bringing new life to the organization sounded almost anachronistic by 2006 in light of his discredited role in the Rwandan genocide as Undersecretary for Peacekeeping, the Iraq All for Food scandal, and the failure of the 2005 UN reforms. Kofi Annan rather tragically learned the ancient wisdom that one needs a long spoon to sup with the devil. <laughs> no prizes for guessing who the devil was. <laughs> Let me now conclude by briefly assessing the late afternoon of Boutros Ghali's life. He left as the oldest UN Secretary General at 74 and was convinced by Jacques Chirac, the French president, to take on the head of the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie, which is basically 52 Francophone African countries promoting French language, culture, etc between 97 and 2002. And he pushed the same democracy development and human rights that he had pushed at the UN. He was also appointed president of the Egyptian Commission for Human Rights in 2004, chaired the Geneva-based South Center between 2003 and 2006, and in 2014, advised General Fatah al-Sisi on foreign policy. Always with an eye to posterity, Boutros Ghali left all his papers at Stanford University in the US in 1996 because he didn't feel it would be well looked after in Egypt. The 93-year-old fell badly at home in Cairo in February 2016 and died a day later in hospital. He was granted a state funeral with full military honors in a ceremony attended by the cream of Egypt's political elite and foreign diplomats. Boutros was buried in the crypt at the Boutrosia family church alongside his grandfather, with whom he shared a stubborn devotion to public service in the true spirit of noblesse of leash. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to you, Professor Andikea Debatu. That was uh, really a, an excellent uh, summary, synopsis, really, of uh, a very, very rich uh, book, although uh, not a pocket book, but it really has um, uh, hundreds of little anecdotes and stories you know, that we could. Um, you could still, you know, delve into and uh, explore more fully, particularly with, as you say, the young students. So I'm going to draw out a few, just a few, a handful, and um, uh, see if we can take some of those forward. So one of the issues you raise, uh, which speaks to not just Egypt, but perhaps many other countries, and maybe I was too in South Africa, the question of leadership at the individual and the as part of the elite, and you describe very well. And I, in my own experience in Geneva and working with uh, friends and colleagues from Egypt, I recognize very well this uh, complexity of their um, elite status. Um, because they tend to come the whole diplomatic community from a few families. Yeah. <laughs> and then <laughs> um, not dissimilar, dissimilar to many other countries I know. Yeah. yeah. In Africa, but also in the South. And, yeah. And uh, yeah. you know, the one that I know a little bit about as well is uh, Brazil. Yeah. <laughs> and also the connection with um, the French. Yeah. And and uh, the uh, politics and the culture of that. 
And, and in this particular case, what's intriguing is a Coptic Christian marrying a Jew. It's a Muslim country. Yeah. So tell us a lot about the influence of the elite in the politics and the religious secularity yeah. of Egypt. And it's a very, very interesting, it's very important to understand Egypt. And why didn't Egypt go, although there were attempts, maybe with the Brotherhood and a few, you know, to, to go down the route of several other Muslim countries that haven't really maintained this secularity mm -hmm. in its politics. But perhaps what you explore here yeah, is the uh, makeup of the leadership and the elite has played a role in that, mm -hmm. maintaining that secularity. So that's the first point. The second point you explore a lot, of, um, which is very intriguing for me also as a student of uh, Egypt and its role uh, in Africa, is the uh, the 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 um, psychological and um, uh, ambition of Egypt to be a player mm -hmm. uh, in its uh, what it uh, 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 describes as its own um, natural setting, which is the Arab countries, with the natural it appears to have a natural uh, ambition uh, to lead. Mm -hmm. Uh, but as you indicate, you know, the Arab League pulled out of Egypt as a, um, a seat of uh, its uh, institution, uh, precisely because it didn't see Egypt as a natural leader. Yeah. But uh, so there's a contradiction there. Yeah. But then, you know, uh, I think the issue of Egypt, its Arab connection, its the Franco-file influence of its leadership, and its complex relationship with Africa, mm -hmm. and how that uh, will play out um, in uh, the next uh, uh, you know decade uh, as uh, the continent really begins to. Uh, develop its own agency. And I speak of the ACTA and what you know role Egypt sees in that context and how what should we expect. So that's that's the second issue. The third one uh, I was also intrigued by, which is very, very relevant today as we speak, is its role in the Israel-Palestinian conflict. Yes. Yeah. Very, very complex. Yeah. And the way you describe, and again, uh, you know, the insight there, which I just wouldn't have picked up, it's negotiation and the way it ends up is very transactional. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, you know, focus on Sinai yes. as a, a, an outcome of the negotiations rather than peace, yeah. which is really the price yeah. we all want. But uh, it didn't seem to play that role. And right now, as you know, there's an, another flare up in the Israel-Palestinian conflict, uh, which has been ongoing for over 50 years, uh, Egypt is still, you know, it's right there. And, you know, it's the, you know, even as we speak today, there's, um, there's a ring around the Gaza, and part of that ring is Egypt. Mm. And uh, the expectation is that Egypt should play a role. Yeah. But what role should we expect? So that's that's the third issue that comes up. The fourth one, I mean, I was very intrigued by this guy you call one of the greatest intellectuals mm -hmm. of the yeah. African continent. And certainly in the context of the UN, yeah. you describe him as you know one of the biggest thinkers. Mm -hmm. I didn't know this myself. Uh, so I'm intrigued. I'm also intrigued by the fact that you, well, you suggest that he's played a big role, ideational role, in normal building, mm -hmm. because uh, you know that's one of the greatest things about the UN. Yeah, its ability to create norms mm -hmm. and then build them, mm -hmm. and for the world. And uh, so there are five massive conferences. Each of them contributed significantly to the world's norms. From the Rio conference to the Beijing conference. Yeah. And I'm a bit intrigued about what role 
already did you play in this. Um, you suggest that you play a big role. But then you bring up this, the real thing was that Google did up an agenda for peace, mm -hmm. which is a contribution to a very critical issue in Africa, which is peace building. Yeah. And, uh, and if indeed this is his work, as you suggest it is, it's a great contribution to a very, very significant issue on this continent, which is peace building. So I'd like, you know, us perhaps to take that forward, you know, as a research uh, in a project. Yes. And then finally, I think that, uh, you know, the other point you make, and you, you, you really describe this extremely well, is the power of the United States, mm -hmm. both as you know part of the P five, yes. or the P three, yes. or the P one, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how they manage to find, really. yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, you know, with the reach of yes. five, yeah, and uh, they could do it, yeah, and, and you know, from the way you describe the role of the United States, and. Um, why that's so important in the current kind of discourse yeah. is precisely because, and I also didn't know this, that he was an advocate for reform yes. of the UN. And I wonder how much of that discussion is relevant or similar to the huge discourse today mm. for you know a, a radical change in the whole architecture of the UN system. Um, and that's grown up uh, because uh, you know, in the 90s, you just didn't have these, the power, as we've seen today, of China, the BRICS, you know, formation, the emerging countries. So he must have seen it. Yes. And um, uh, and if he indeed he did, you know, he had a great foresight. So, you know, so there's something there, I think, for us to, to draw on. Um, so that's, those are my, you know, so insights. But the one thing I was intrigued about, I mean, this is... Um, you know, it was a bit um, puzzled uh, that you only mentioned Nelson Mandela once. And that although this is such a critical period for the transition in South Africa, you don't talk about it. Yeah. And uh, so my intrigue was partly about why it wasn't there, but also my intrigue was about, so what did Boutrous Boutrous Garden think? What was his role in the anti apartheid movement? Um, because he was the Minister of Foreign Affairs in the 80s. And what did he do? You know, this was the greatest moment in the UN. Nelson Mandela was there. Where was he? You know, there's no connection. So that's my question. So thank you very much. It really, it really was a fascinating read, and I really recommend it highly to certainly all our students, <laughs> but everybody else really is interested in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your excellence. I just found this place. And can you see this man? I mean, he has it all here. <laughs> <laughs> remarkable. I mean, the remarkable. I always, every time I come across what he has written, he yeah. never ceases to amaze me. But what I found interesting and in intriguing, and in addition to the Mandela kind of omission is a comparison between uh, Boutros Gali and Anand, right. which I think was yeah. misplaced. I would have thought that the best kind of contrastor is your other subject in Beki. Mm -hmm. They share with the <laughs> Boutros Gali, I think uh, this intellectual you know, disposition, the arrogance. <laughs> <laughs> And I think as prophets, both of them, yes, uh, sort of fail to realize that when you are a diplomat, when you are sort of a scheme builder, it's the art of the possible, yes, that you do not uh, disregard completely the world as it is. I would have thought, for me, that is the biggest paradox about him, Becky and him, that you know, here they are, they are real, the real politics, if you want. But somehow they miss, is this simply uh, a matter of arrogance planning to see uh, beyond themselves or, or is this sort of prophetic kind of sacrifice mm -hmm. that, you know, ir irrespective of what they might have done, yeah. this is where they will take the last step. Yeah. I, I found that very interesting because uh, with Mbeki, as you know, 
sort of uh, he had the same disposition. Yeah. And uh, he would say in terms of uh, what it took mm-hmm. as an African leader, probably one who had really visionary. I mean, you 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 remember his speech at Amman Africa. Yes. And how he articulated his vision. Yeah. But he has also turned out. I'm not talking about the president, the, the president, yeah. the president of South Africa. I'm not. Yeah. Uh, I would not go there. He turned out not yet really to be a successful, uh, you know, president. He was not a successful politician, yeah. partly because of this isolation and the arrogance yeah. in terms of what. Whereas uh, Mandela, of course, is a part. Uh, my, my favorite one, not because I interact with him. Of course, whom I thought might have been a better president was Mutante. I, I won't say anything about the, the others. But Mutante. Yeah. But yeah. oh, yeah. well, he was president uh, for a while. Uh, yeah, he was president for a while as a, a caretaker. Yes. So I'm, I'm intrigued in terms of this omission of Mandela and then sort of not really contrasting you to your other subject. Yes. Which I done very well. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. yes. <laughs> well, they introduce themselves, so yeah, I know <laughs> I know who I'm interacting with. Hi, uh, my name is Benzi, and I'm from the School of Economics. Thank you very much for this presentation. Um, yes. uh, I call him BBG, so BBG is a little bit before my time. I grew up with um, Kofi Annan, uh, oh, my okay. secretary general. Oh, my parents grew up with BBG, so it's okay. really interesting. I would just like to find out, um, similar to the uh, question on um, the Israel-Palestine conflict, I'm actually interested, what do you think, or how do you think BBG would handle what's happening in West Africa with the Juntas and the Mali, and that given his background, his upbringing, his relationship to France, um, but also his strong sort of um, his strong promotion of peace and security, as well as like the interregional, uh, you know, involving interregional powers and things like that. So, how do you think, or what do you think he would advise, um, or yeah, West Africa to deal with that situation to bring it to a to a place of peace, as well as the issue with France, as well in the region. That's my question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Anyone else? Yes, to the um, I'm interested in the value of democratization. Can we know Daniel. who you are? Oh, sorry, yes, of course. Sorry, my name is Daniel. Uh, You're probably very famous. No, okay. I don't know who he is. <laughs> Only the poor undergraduate who wants an explanation of why they're failing. <laughs> <laughs> no, so um, I'm an early career UCT academic, okay. a lecturer in the Department of Philosophy, okay. a lecturer in the School of Economics, okay. and then I also work in uh, one of the research units, uh, UC, or a couple of the research units for UCT. Yeah. And um, so, so because I'm interested in this nexus between security and development, um, and also this idea of trying to bring in a consistent ideology mm-hmm. towards the international sphere and foreign policy in the international sphere and domestic policy. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in this idea of democratization of, of uh, international negotiations and uh, democratization of, of, of the UN structure framework. And I wonder, considering the domestic policy of Egypt, whether there is some tension there mm. between a push for democratization mm. um, on the one hand, and but also representing governments that have not always been mm. particularly democratic or particularly expressed a desire to be mm. democratic, and how that really influences how we should think about well, the why is that we would be put forward, yeah. uh, particularly in this idea of Egypt leading the Arab uh, states or leading um, integration, whether this is this should be seen as a an instrumental tool, yeah, as opposed to a political idea. Great, thank you.
another Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Prophet Bob. And yes, I'm Daniel uh, from this faculty and a friend of uh, uh, the Mandela School. Uh, and perhaps a hypothetical uh, idea for you. Had Butros Gali got in a second term, yeah, it's a different way. The Americans have abstained or not invoked their free power. What do you think his second term will now happen? Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, but it, well, thank you for the presentation. My name is uh, Michael I'm here at the uh, Nelson at the School of Governance. Do you have a model of development policy impact? I think my I've got two questions. Firstly, my my question is around information. And uh Robert Mugabe, I think would also because I'm from Smog, I think I'll also turn a very uh, arrogant president who stood at the UN and called several times on the information of the Security Council, stating that the interests of uh the UN are not representative of African interests. And it seems that these leaders who diligently stand at the UN Security Council or at the UN are then demonized. And um, as a, a young person who is representing young people's interests, who are impatient with the way things are, are moving in the system, we, we, we grew up hearing that the UN was formed by peace southern states, which were colonial states, right? Uh, we're coming from a period where our interests of the Africans were represented by colonial states. How do we move away from this narrative that we've, we've been forged for so many years? And the leaders that we, we look up to who speak about the real interests of the Africans not being represented. I mean, despite, um, and you know, the, I, what was interesting is that you said he represented the interest of the Africans at the UN, right? But PNG was viewed to be serving an autocratic regime in Egypt, which I also then looked at my context and I said, Mugabe is also seen in the same light, right? We we quickly deem these leaders in the same light that, okay, if he speaks upon not representing African interests, we come back home and say, this is an autocratic regime. So my question then becomes, how do we move away from that. And secondly, the my, my second question was in in uh, in promoting um international unity and international cooperation. I think Professor Tart on the African free trade continental agreement that we have, how do we unify as Africans to start to speak about things which are meaningful for us and meaningful to our economies and our regional peace and security? Because it seems that the moment we try and engage in those, the EU has got propositions. They come in with propositions to say that um, we've got the money to assist you with the just um, uh, energy transition. This is our plea. How do we um, restrain or refrain from engaging in such uh, engagements and looking particularly at African interests, pushing our interests ahead? So that every time we speak about Africa, it's not referencing to organizations or institutions which were created during the colonial period. Because honestly, it seems this is especially as a young person who's who's grown up in a different time periods to my 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 elders, it seems it's always reverting back to that instance. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Michael. Anybody else? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 We are always talking about the United Nations countries of nation policy and the United Nations peacekeeping operations in Africa. But uh, my question is about the African Union's peacekeeping cooperation in Africa. And maybe, can, uh, as you know, the African Union is is uh, trying to play a role in, uh, in conflict resolution in Africa. Can we say uh, maybe that the Union can play a role in the Middle East to solve the problems? Maybe we can say uh, we can say uh, African solutions for African problems. 
Can you say the Middle East and Middle East problems for Middle East Okay, thank you so much. Uh, someone online, so Hafta, please come in. Is that General Hafta? <laughs> the Libyan, the Libyan war. <laughs> the same guy. Hafta, you will have to. Yeah. <laughs> yourself. <laughs> um, am I? Is am I mute? Yes, please. I can. We can hear you. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Pro, for the detail and actually a thought-provoking uh, presentation and uh, also a book, which uh, for some of us is also very important, um, specifically for myself. I have read a lot about Kofi Annan, um, but uh, about Butros Butros Gale, my 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 knowledge is a little bit. I mean, I can't compare with Kofi Annan, so it was a very interesting. So, um, as a uh, prof said, my name is Hafte, and I'm a post a post doctoral fellow at the Nelson Mandela uh, School of Public Governance. But uh, for today, I'm just attending online. Um, I just I just have a question. Um, what did he play? I mean, what did uh, Butros Butros Gali played and, and play in um, pushing the permanent members of the Security Council to reform the Security Council itself? Um, as we know, Kofi Annan tried his best to promoting dialogue and especially limiting the the the, the use of veto power. I mean, veto power and enlarging the members of the Security Council. But comparing to Kofi Annan, how can we explain or what did Butros Butros Gali play in pushing the members of the Security Council, put too much pressure on the members of the Security Council to at least to at least limit the use of veto power or and enlarging the members of the security council that is the first thing and and uh, uh, and um how do we what how do you want us to remember uh uh butros butros gali in terms of peacekeeping issues in africa you know especially during his time where um where there was a genocide and uh, and uh, and how do you want us to remember or how do you want africa to remember him and lastly was he more a tenden tendency towards the arab or towards africa because he is from uh, from africa to one to one side and is also um arab so was he more tend towards africa supporting africa supporting african union or he was just towards the 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 the, the Middle East and uh, and the Arab, and finally uh, I just want to say you know uh, um, the U.S. and the U.S. during that time was hesitant on him. That's the reason why he didn't get the opportunity to lead for the second term, and um, ultimately they brought Kofi Annan from Africa. Was that a kind of massaging us that uh, Butros Butros Gali was African son and that uh, we growing African son, another African son? So you don't have to complain about that. Just uh, I just want to raise this issue. But thank you so much for this very interesting presentation. Thanks, Hafta. Anybody else? Okay, that's about seventy. <laughs> that's about uh, seventeen points, <laughs> including the chairs. <laughs> so let me see if I can dodge some bullets. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Really interesting questions. I think absolutely, Ambassador. The fact of Boutros's Coptic Christian identity and the Jewish wife was absolutely essential in explaining him, a marginal figure within Egypt who was playing the role of foreign minister but could not be called foreign minister, had to be called minister of state even when he was actually doing the job. So that's important. Um, I think also um, it's important to note that Sadat 
had great disdain for a lot of his Arab neighbors when he was negotiating this Camp David Accord in 1977-78. He was very dismissive of their views, as Boutros's memoirs made very clear. And as you noted, it was a very transactional and parochial thing where he was wanting the Sinai and negotiating on behalf of the Palestinians without the Palestinians being at the table. Mm -hmm. So he lost the Arabs. He also trusted Jimmy Carter too much. Although I do think Carter's role was very positive and he should have shared the Nobel Prize with Sadat and Begui uh, due to his role in this uh, in the peace process, which I hadn't realized. He was actually drafting whole like peace agreements uh, mm -hmm. himself. So he really had a very hands-on advantage. Um, so I think that was part of, in my view, what um, did Egypt in and made it isolated. And it's going to be very interesting in this current Gaza dispute, yeah. whether Egypt actually follows Israel's position and suffocates Gaza in the same way that Israel is attempting to suffocate it or actually listens to the Arab street, which is going to provide a lot of pressure on the leaders to actually try to alleviate some of the Palestinian suffering. So it's going to be interesting to see how Egyptian foreign policy reacts to the current crisis, because I do think the population will remain very sympathetic to the plight of the Palestinians. Um, I think in terms of... Uh, an agenda for peace, by the way, Boutros Ghali was really personally responsible for it. He did 40 drafts of the agenda for peace, and he took it like a professorial task uh, that he is. So his fingerprints were all over the place. It wasn't just that he put his name on the document. He really did play a role. And Boutros had a sense of history. So he saw the post-Cold War world because it was the UN Security Council that had asked him to come up with an agenda for peace in the same terms as the Congress of Vienna in 1815, the Versailles Treaty in 1919, and then 1945, San Francisco. He saw it as an opportunity to reshape a new world. So he thought in those terms, and he really did have a very personal view of it. Yeah, the power of the US was absolutely incredible in removing Boutros, and it was really more Madeleine Albright than Bill Clinton. I don't think Bill Clinton worried one way or the other, but Madeleine Albright, uh, Boutros did not respect her as a diplomat or as an intellectual. He felt he was a lightweight, and just by dint of representing the US, her position should just carry through. You know, it compared the US to being the new Roman Empire, basically. So that lack of respect for Madeleine Albright and misreading of the US political system, I think, is what did him in. Because Madeleine Albright was trying to tell him what to do which UN special representatives to appoint, um, what to say to the Washington Post, not to mention the US $1 billion debt when he went to Washington. And uh, Boutros just ignored much of the advice he'd been given. Mm -hmm. Kofi Annan was the complete opposite. I mean, Madeleine Albright was screaming over the phone at Kofi Annan when he went to Baghdad to visit uh, Saddam Hussein and try to negotiate a peace deal. Mm -hmm. So that was the difference. Boutros stood his ground, although, the strange thing is that he appointed more Americans to senior positions than any of his predecessors. 
So he was astute enough to also play the game. Americans, Joseph Connor was actually the head of uh, management and reforms within the UN, and that was done for America as well. So he knew how to play the game. He wasn't some kind of naive professor. Um, new agenda for peace has some interesting reform ideas like um, UN Security Council, a stronger United Nations Peace Building Commission, and a stronger link between security and development. And, you know, it, it reminds us that only 20% of the SDGs are on track to be um, achieved. And also that conflicts have increased over the last four or five years. So those are some of the key points that I think build on Boutros Ghali's and Agenda for Peace. Um, the issue of South Africa, you know, I didn't, um, the UN mission on which I also served uh, that was here in South Africa was more an observer mission to support South Africa's transition. What was unique about South Africa is that unlike in many other cases, you negotiated your transition yourself. It wasn't done by the UN. The UN officials were there in a supporting capacity. So that's why I didn't feel that I should, you know, uh, mention or engage with uh, the UN role because the UN role was very small. It had Angela Davis and Lakda Brahimi as special representatives, but they weren't calling the shots or leading the negotiations. The South Africans were doing it themselves. And as for Mandela, I mean, I have a great deal of respect for him, but I think you know, as a South African government official, he didn't run the country. Yeah. Thabo Mbeki was running the country even during those five years. He wasn't chairing cabinet meetings. Yeah. And he did a lot of the ceremonial things like, like you know, go, putting on a Springbok jersey and going to Orania and having tea with Favut's widow and all these kinds of things that matter. You know, Madiba magic, basically. So, you know, I mean, I don't want to underplay the role of someone who spent a third of his life in prison. Mandela did real sacrifices, but by the time he took office in his late 70s, he really wasn't doing the hands-on stuff, as he himself yes. admitted. So he didn't play that big a role. And um, my fellow Rhodes Scholar here, Professor Kalula, it's a very good point uh, on uh, Boutros Ghali and Mbeki, but you see, Whereas Boutros Ghali was, uh, I agree with you that both were philosopher kings and visionaries, but one was a head of state with a lot more powers and one was a lowly secretary general and then a de facto foreign minister. So I thought it's better not to mix up mangoes and guavas but to compare guavas and guavas. So that's why I thought comparing two UN secretaries yes. general yes. with the same powers, very limited powers, would make more sense. But it's interesting that you caught that comparison. And I don't know what it says about me having written about these two figures, <laughs> if you think that they're both very arrogant uh, figures. <laughs> so, and then but the question of the, I think you said you're born free, right? You're a Kofi Annan generation. Uh, you, well, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily a born free. Oh, okay. I, I, I was wondering. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not born free. I was born free. Okay, um, well, you missed for Chris Garley. But yes, I, okay. I, I'm just saying Kofi Annan was more prominent for me growing up. That's okay. what I remember. All right. More. You were too young. I was too young to, yes, exactly. Okay. So, yeah. So, let me respond to my sister with the, she has a Model C accent. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Let me respond. Um, I think the most 
I mean, it's a difficult question. These, what would Jesus have done? I, I got one yesterday as well. It's very hard to answer hypothetical questions. And E.H. Carr has one not, not to do it, the historian, because history is about what happened, not what might have happened. But what I would say is we need to understand the rather limited powers of the Secretary General's office. You know, he's a servant of the UN Security Council. And he had very limited opportunities to actually take initiatives. You know, he can bring matters that are of urgent attention to the UN Security Council, but you can't override the P5. They are the ones that call the shots, yes. <laughs> which was why Boutros Ghali was so frustrated. Yeah. You know, they would do impossible mandates and then ask the UN to implement and then blame the UN when it didn't work. But it was Britain and France that were saying, don't bomb Serbia because we have troops on the ground and we don't want to endanger our groups. So the UN was often scapegoated in that way. So I think there's only a limited amount that Boutros Ghali could have done if he'd been alive and Secretary General in the Francophone countries. The UN doesn't really have much of a mandate when it comes to military coup d'etats anyway, you know? So um, I don't think that he would have done much even on behalf of France as a Francophile himself. But that was his one blind spot, the fact that he was besotted with France. <laughs> um, I think, uh, let me go to the question of our famous professor. Uh, I think Putroskali believed, I think I agree with you that there was a tension there. He believed in democratization, at least he preached belief in democratization at both the domestic and international level, but he really seemed to push it more at the international level than the domestic level. Rhetorically, at least though, he pushed for both. But since you are serving two military autocrats effectively in Sadat and Mubarak, how much of democratization are you doing at home? So that tension was always there, but at least intuitively and intellectually, I think he believed that both must be pursued simultaneously at the same time. Um, and then, some of the, I think I got another futurology question from Daniel, Daniel Munene, which is <laughs> what would Boutros have? Yes, <laughs> and that's what I call it. You know, it's Sangoma question. <laughs> you know, what would what would Boutros have done if he had continued on for a second term? I think much of what Kofi Annan did would have happened. So transitional justice tribunals in Bosnia and uh, that happened and Rwanda would have been continued. Uh, things like the International Criminal Court would have been pursued. Um, peacekeeping would have been rather limited because the UN got very badly burnt in Rwanda and Bosnia. And that retrenchment that happened even under Kofi Annan would have happened under him. So it's just re-emphasizing the rather limited powers of the position again, you know? It, you know, a biography makes him like a larger than life figure. It's the great man, History, great man version of history, but really in reality, these are people with very limited powers, even though we're focusing on a microscope on them. And then in terms of my brother there on Robert Mugabe, you know the Yorubas, my, my ethnic group of Southwest Nigeria say, even a madman can sometimes make some sense. <laughs> Mugabe, Mugabe was saying the right things on the UN Security Council, even if he was doing the wrong things at home. Uh, and I believe that the UN Security Council needs to be expanded. Yeah. You need to bring in Nigeria, South Africa, Brazil, and India in that order. <laughs> uh, the, the council hasn't been reformed 
since 1965. Yeah. It represents the world of 1945, yeah. not the world of 2023. Its legitimacy is spread there. And fortunately, and Britain and France may have been great powers in 45. They are certainly not great powers today. They are hyperactive powers, pretending <laughs> to be great powers, particularly after Brexit. So, you know, um, India has overtaken France, for example, in terms of economic might. Brazil will as well soon. So I think we have to reflect reality and restructure it. Fortunately, the US and Joseph Biden has pledged support for an expansion to Africa and Latin America. And I think we should take this as an opportunity to call their bluff and try to put pressure on the Chinese and Russians and French and British to actually support Security Council report. And we came very close under Kofi Annan in 2005. Ironically, it was the Africans with the rather silly Ezzawini consensus, the rather maximalist position of insisting on the veto when Germany, Brazil, India, Japan were prepared to give up the veto, enter the council, and negotiate from within. I think we need to be more pragmatic ourselves, but it does need to happen. We're 27% of the membership. It's a crying shame that we don't have permanent representative on the council, especially with 84% of peacekeepers UN deployed in Africa. Um, and I think the point about Africa and where Africa is, you know, 16% of intra-regional trade, as I said yesterday, is within Africa. In Asia or Southeast Asia, it's closer to 50%, and in the European Union, closer to 60 to 70%, you know? So that's what we need to do, beneficiation, industrialization, not just getting stuff out of the ground and exporting it and having goods we can exchange ourselves. We're the only continent, as I keep repeating, with 16 landlocked countries. We need to actually forge more genuine economic integration and then have countries like Nigeria and South Africa, as I also said, who account for 60% of the economies of Western Southern Africa, basically push and lead the process, but you need vision and leadership, which also hasn't always been there. You talk about the AU, my sister, uh, but I think it's also important to look at ECOWAS and others. But what we're suffering, I agree, Africans should be able to keep peace in other parts of the world, and they do. Nigerians, Ghanaians, Rwandans, others have kept peace in other parts of the world, in Bosnia and Lebanon, the Ghanaians had a very active engagement there. But there's a peacekeeping paradox at the moment. The more willing Africans that are prepared to do enforcement don't have the logistics and the funding. And the UN won't allow them to have assessed contributions, even though the US and other countries like Britain seem to be moving towards supporting that. That would be the most sensible approach. And the people that are more able, that work on the UN peacekeeping missions, like the Indians, the Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, they're not prepared to risk the lives of their peacekeepers in places like the Eastern Congo because of the political risks that are involved. So until we actually find a solution to the black peacekeeping paradox, where the more willing are not able and the more capacitated are not willing, we're not going to resolve the problem. But assess contributions and the kind of regional peace enforcers that Guterres is calling for in a new agenda for peace. That's the way to go. Um, Boutros Ghali did push for UN Security Council reform, but I don't think that the circumstances were correct for it to be successful during his time, given the disasters that had happened in Bosnia and in Rwanda. Um, and then I think the last question uh, that I have now, 
Butroskali, was he more African or Asian? I think that was uh, General Hafter's uh, question. Um, there was, I, I think Boutros was definitely, his Arab identity was definitely the stronger identity. Having grown up in Egypt all his life and pushed for Arab issues, done his PhD on there, even studied Islamic law. He was deeply uh, into that culture. But I think when he became a uh, de facto foreign minister, he was the one that attended all of the OAU summits. He got to know all of the African leaders and foreign ministers. And he pushed a really strong Pan-African line. And at the UN, we also saw his concern with an even-handed interest and attention to Africa. So that's how I would answer that. I think I've answered most of them. Yeah, fantastic. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Professor. And I think the bar, I mean, it's really been a, a pleasure, an absolute pleasure to both read this amazing book. Um, really, you've done us all a great uh, duty and uh, justice by uh, bringing before yeah. somebody who really um, is not that well known yeah. on that mm -hmm. continent. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know, uh, certainly, the um, uh, you know, the way you describe him as one of the leading thinkers uh, and one of the best um, that serves in this capacity, mm -hmm. it's really uh, something that students should know more about. And certainly a lot uh, of ideas uh, that uh, he has support for that are some of the norms and values mm -hmm. that can still be taken further by students. So um, I think it's a great contribution and um, I want to say that we would uh, not just welcome you, we would urge you to come and share your knowledge with our students. <laughs> certainly it's a space uh, in the school which is uh, um, uh, uh, important for us to, um, uh, to add to, to, to our curriculum. And uh, I, I really uh, hope that we can continue to build this, uh, this relationship as we go forward. Uh, we have uh, in the school, the ambition to bring some of the best thinkers of the continent, and you certainly are in that. Thank uh, you, John. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you to everyone for joining us today. Yes, there are a few books yes. there at a reduced 200 rand, but we have no cash machine. <laughs> <laughs> So catch only, catch and carry.